In this video, I'd like to talk about a mindset trap that's a bit harder to quantify. It's harder to pin down, but it's also this psychological phenomena that underpins so much of our behavior. It's making treatment decisions built around asymmetrical information. In other words, making uninformed choices because we only have part of the story. In our last few videos, we revealed three mindset mistakes that hurt people's chances for hair regrowth. Maybe I just need more time for results, not solving for both sides of the hair loss equation, and quitting treatments too early because of hair shedding. Now I'd like to talk about a treatment mistake that involves people's exposure to misinformation. And I think one of the best ways to illustrate this is through a survey that we initiated on people not wanting to use finasteride. Recently, we surveyed men with pattern hair loss who have opted not to use finasteride. When we asked them why, we got an array of responses. I tried finasteride, but I got side effects. Finasteride doesn't fit with my worldview. I don't like being dependent on medications. We're conceiving soon and I want to wait. Now, some of these responses are rooted in preference. Some of them are rooted in experience and some are rooted in information. And for responses rooted in preference or experience, there's really no arguing here. I mean, if you tried finasteride, but you got side effects, it makes sense to seek other options. And if you want to try a natural approach first, I'm all for that. Just follow our results horizon so you don't quit a regimen too early or hang on too long before reevaluating. But what about responses rooted in information? Like this concern about prostate cancer. Well, we asked these men to elaborate and nearly all of them gave the same answer. I saw a study showing that finasteride increases my risk of prostate cancer. Prostate cancer runs in my family, so I don't want to take this drug. Now, these men aren't wrong. This study does exist. It was a 2003 clinical trial on thousands of men to test whether finasteride might actually prevent prostate cancer. Over a seven year period, finasteride was linked to a 25% reduced risk of prostate cancer, but unfortunately, a significant increased risk of high-grade prostate cancer. And that's an alarming statistic and one that got a lot of people concerned. But it's also not the whole story because here's what people don't know. First, prostate cancer grows very slowly. It's also very uncommon in men under 40 years old. So a prevention study lasting just seven years, well, that really isn't the best time frame for evaluation. We actually need a longer window of time so that men taking finasteride can grow old enough where a diagnosis becomes more likely. And with that longer time window, we can increase our statistical power and gain better clarity with the data so we understand the real risks. This is exactly why researchers, after getting this initial data, extended this prostate cancer prevention study to nine years, and then to 12 years, and later, all the way to 18 years. And interestingly, during these extension periods, that link between finasteride and high-grade prostate cancer, well, it actually completely washed out. In other words, there was no statistical difference between diagnoses of high-grade prostate cancer in men taking or not taking finasteride. In fact, finasteride remained directionally linked to a 25% lower risk of prostate cancer overall throughout the duration of this 18-year period. And while that 2003 report was covered by most media outlets, I can guarantee you that these follow-up studies, well, they barely received any media attention at all, which is why so few men actually know about them and are rooted in the earlier belief. Now, this is a perfect example of what I would consider making a treatment decision based on asymmetrical information. In other words, avoiding finasteride over fears of prostate cancer without knowing about the extension studies that quelled these concerns. Now, our exposure to asymmetrical information, it, it doesn't just prevent us from taking action on our hair, it can also push us towards choices that actually may worsen our health outcomes. Because in this small survey that we did, nearly all of the men avoiding finasteride over concerns of prostate cancer, well, they also told us that they take a daily multivitamin for general health purposes, and specifically a multivitamin that contains both selenium and vitamin E. Why is this ironic? Well, a 2003 interventional study on 35,000 men found that men supplementing with selenium and vitamin E, well, 
they were actually getting more prostate cancer. And unlike finasteride, when researchers extended this study another few years, that relationship actually worsened. In fact, in a subset analysis of the final data set, investigators stated that in men with low selenium levels, vitamin E increased their risk of prostate cancer by 63%, and that in men with adequate selenium levels, selenium supplements increased the risk of high-grade prostate cancer by 91%. Long story short, men avoiding finasteride over concerns of prostate cancer were also taking supplements that likely increased their risks of prostate cancer without any idea at all, and all because of exposure to what I call asymmetrical information. This is why I personally feel that health education is so important, because with education, we can avoid making treatment decisions that might be built around partial information or even misinformation. We can also avoid other pitfalls and fallacies, like believing that just because something is natural, like vitamin E or selenium supplementation, well, then it must be safe because we know that the data show that's not always true. Again, if you're avoiding hair loss drugs out of preference or experience, there is no arguing here. But if your avoidance is rooted in information, we need to press deeper because we need to actually ensure that our opinions are not misinformed. Now, I know that describing this concept feels a bit nebulous and it's a bit hard to define, but you'd be surprised how many times I see asymmetrical information hurting people's outcomes with their hair. So let's go through just a few more examples. We'll start with the belief, the basis for that belief, and then how that basis actually compares to reality. Belief. Saw palmetto didn't regrow my hair, so now, I'll up the ante and try a combination of DHT reducers, saw palmetto, astaxanthin, reishi mushroom extract, and zinc. The basis. By combining many natural DHT blockers into one, maybe I'll reduce DHT levels better than with saw palmetto alone, and maybe I'll grow more hair. The reality. Well, unfortunately, in biology, taking more of something doesn't always necessarily equate to better results, especially when the things you're taking in this case, all target similar pathways to reduce DHT. And in this instance, that's 5-alpha reductase inhibition. For instance, in this study, taking three times the daily dose of saw palmetto for one year did not lead to three times better improvements to an enlarged prostate. Rather, it led to the same improvements as a standard 320 milligram dose. Similarly, this study showed that megadosing saw palmetto and astaxanthin together did not reduce blood levels of DHT any better than a small amount of saw palmetto and astaxanthin. And so knowing this, when you look at clinical data on supplements like Nutrafol, which happen to combine many potential DHT reducers into one supplement, the hair regrowth that they're seeing, well, it's not really that more impressive than what we'd expect from a typical dose of saw palmetto alone. Long story short, Natural combination DHT reducers, yes, they might reduce a little more DHT, but in most cases, based on the data, it's probably not enough of a reduction to stimulate significantly more hair regrowth for people trying the natural methods. And it's certainly not enough to warrant the cost increase versus saw palmetto alone. And for this reason, if you're not seeing an effect from saw palmetto by itself, I think that your better bet is to actually jump to a significantly more powerful DHT reducer like finasteride, or layer in other interventions that target things beyond just DHT. Microneedling, ketoconazole, minoxidil, massaging, and other interventions in our ultimate guides. Here are a few more examples of what I would describe asymmetrical information decision-making, but with a little bit less detail. The belief. Scalp massages did not work for me, so I am going to try Paul Taylor's exercises. The basis. Paul Taylor's approach makes more sense to me, and I've read of his success stories. The reality, scalp massaging probably shares significant mechanistic overlap with Paul Taylor's exercises. So if massaging didn't work for you, a better bet to place is not to try something similar. It's to take an entirely different approach. Belief, PRP didn't work for me, so I'd like to try exosomes. The basis, my dermatologist said that her patients are getting great results. Reality. Hair loss therapies like PRP, PRP plus A cell, adipose derived stem cells, and even exosomes, they all work in part through acute inflammation generation. 
They also cost thousands of dollars and seem to net around the same ballpark for hair regrowth, about a 10 to 30% increase in hair counts. On the contrary, microneedling costs $10, hits the same mechanisms, and gets us roughly the same regrowth. So don't let your dermatologist talk you into these things unless you're absolutely price insensitive. And then of course, there are examples where somebody's beliefs, well, they actually contradict their own actions. This is a form of cognitive dissonance. For example, let's say that a person is only interested in regrowing their hair naturally, but simultaneously, they're supplementing with 16 different plant extracts at concentrations thousands of times beyond our natural consumptive capabilities. And they bought these extracts from a laboratory with no purity testing or long-term safety data on a single ingredient. To me, this person's definition of natural feels a bit arbitrary. In my eyes, there's nothing natural about manufacturing or consuming ingredients in this capacity. In fact, ingesting these things, they might come with health risks that far outweigh their benefits. And it might make more sense to just use better regulated, better studied drugs. Another example, a person says that their health means more than anything to them. Simultaneously, they've had an iron deficiency for the last 10 years. They don't respond well to iron supplements, but they won't try eating meat because it conflicts with their ethical considerations. I completely understand this, and I would never, ever want to impose my own dietary ideologies or worldviews onto others. I also respect everybody's eating choices, and I think that you can see hair regrowth through a lot of different means. At the same time, I worry that this person's ethical considerations, well, I worry that they might be taking priority over their actual health and that they might be limiting their ability to improve their hair loss unless they undergo a mindset shift or find another way to address that iron deficiency. So if you want to increase your chances for hair regrowth, try to avoid decision-making rooted in asymmetrical information or in cognitive dissonance. The best way to do this is to ask yourself why you're following a certain treatment approach. If the answers revolve around preference or experience, great. But if they revolve around information, I would dig deeper and make sure that those opinions align with all sides of the evidence. And that is it. I hope you've enjoyed this video series so far. We're gonna have more treatment mistakes videos coming. And if you have any questions at all, you can reach out below. Thank you.